down the center here. Without further, any further ado, here is the tour through the manuals. My first question to all of you is, does this presentation act as a replacement for reading the manuals? No! Why? Because you're not covering everything in the manual. Exactly. This is a hugely abbreviated form of everything that's in the manuals. Uh, like Alonzo said earlier, there are four of them this year, and uh, they will provide a sort of encyclopedic knowledge of all the rules and regulations of first if you read through all of them. This is just a way to introduce you to what the most important stuff is in the manuals. Make sure that you read the manuals for more specific coverage of every topic listed in this presentation. Okay, first the robot and you. What is FIRST and what is FTC? So FIRST stands for, for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. It's basically an organization, that a, a national organization, international actually, but mostly in the US, that was founded for the purpose of being a very um, structured extracurricular for STEM students to participate in, especially STEM high school students. It was adapted from a course at MIT that Woody Flowers created, uh, and I'll talk about that later, but it's obviously very fun, it involves building robots, we all know. Colleges love FIRST. As Jack mentioned earlier, FIRST alumni get more scholarships per capita than any other sports, which means that um, if you participate in FIRST, you have a better chance of getting more money from colleges than if you participated in football or basketball or whatever other sports you have. So in other words, college, uh, FIRST is just a great opportunity for students to do well in college and get plenty of money and be able to participate in whatever college they want to. Uh, FIRST has four programs. The first uh, tech challenge is the second largest program with FRC, the first robotics challenge being even larger, first robotics competition, sorry, and with the FLL and the FLL Junior also being operated by FIRST. So we're the third largest program. These programs are aimed toward younger students, FLL programs are, but they create excellent feeder opportunities for FTC and FRC teams because creating FLL and FLL junior teams is a great opportunity for us and FRC teams to, FRC teams to do outreach. So um, it's definitely something we want to consider. If not this year due to COVID, then certainly other years. Gracious professionalism. This is the philosophy of FIRST. It is divided into two parts, signified by its two words. Gracious, be kind and respectful to others. Professional, strive to win and be the best player slash team you can be. So basically, Take your job seriously. Take your position in the team seriously. Take your work seriously and be proud of it, while at the same time being respectful about, uh, of everybody else as well. One thing we in conductivity like to do is if we see behavior that isn't uh, in line with the goals of FIRST, we just uh, give a short reminder to keep a GP. And that helps, um, and that's just a really quick way to make sure we're remaining gracious professional, uh, graciously professional throughout our club time and in our tournament time. Uh, and you can see, here's a good example of two robots being graciously professional. People to know. So we said a lot of names in this club so far. Here are the most important names that you might want to learn in order to know what we're talking about. Woody Flowers, co-founder of FIRST. He's the guy, uh, he's the professor at MIT who made the original engineering and design class and then later adapted it nationally to make FIRST. Uh, Don Lutz, director of Colorado first. You'll probably see her almost certainly at the state championships and probably at many qualifying tournaments as well. She's extremely friendly and very helpful for teams, so she's a great resource. She, I believe she is online on the discords, the, FR, the FTC discord, probably the FRC discord as well, so you might be able to contact her through that channel. If that uh, fails, you can also send her an email. She's uh, a great resource to look for as to what Colorado First is doing specifically, and Colorado First is obviously the regional director of First for Colorado. Uh, team 6929, Dataforce. They are very big in the Colorado First community and in the First community in general. They have gone to Worlds many times throughout their career and have won Worlds a few times as well. What, why we care about them is because they're very helpful this year and they, last year, and they had a very uh, crucial relationship with each of our two teams. They actually came into Chatfield and mentored us. Not only that, but they helped both teams solve problems they had during the tournaments last year. So obviously they're extremely helpful and they're good people to know. Uh, 
they are also on the Colorado FTC Discord. So if you have programming or mechanical questions and you want to ask a more experienced FTCer, they're great people to ask. You can find them on the right sidebar of the Discord. They have data force listed after their name and you can DM them. Okay, uh, obviously they're not the only great teams in Colorado though. You can ask any uh, of the Colorado's top teams or any of Colorado's teams. And most people in first are very gracious and professional and very happy to help. So you're not alone at first. The competitions themselves, these are the heart and soul of first. Teams congregate usually in a high school to show off their robots to judges and compete. Registration is required. We already paid that, as Mr. Alonso mentioned earlier. Um, and there are a couple types of competitions. So we have scrimmages. We didn't participate in these last year, but they're still very important because they allow you to practice with your robot in an actual setting, in an actual tournament setting. They're organized typically by teams. Um, we don't know if they're going to happen this year. It's kind of iffy due to COVID. Um, if I get any information on that, we'll make sure to tell you uh, because they really are a great resource um, to be able to test your robot. Really uh, the most advanced form of prototyping, one can say. Qualifying tournaments are the first type of tournament we'll likely go to. They are the tournaments that qualify us for the championship tournaments, the Colorado State Championship, um, which has a higher level of competition than the qualifying tourneys. And then if we do well in the state championship, we go to Worlds, which is in either Houston or Detroit. We'll probably go to Houston. And um, we, uh, if we win that, well, uh, then we're getting somewhere. <laughs> do I get a raise? <laughs> Ten oh, percent. You can ask Mr. <laughs> yeah, I can't hurt. Okay, so let's get into the structure of each tournament itself. Um, we start with egregious behavior, yellow and red cards. I won't spend too much time on this since it's never been an issue for our teams before and it probably won't be in the future, but it's a good idea to just gloss over it quickly. Uh, egregious behavior isn't GP. That's basically all there is to it. Uh, look at the referees. They watch and score matches as and after they happen. Their word is final. Um, in that once they once they've won a disputation, um, you can't dispute it anymore. There's no like higher appeal of referee. However, you can dispute their rulings, not by showing them a video, just like in sports they won't do that, but you can do so by um, asking questions in the question box, which is an actual physical marked by tape box in the tournaments, and by um, making sure you ask your question about the match in a timely manner. There are specific rules about that that I've listed on the card. As for yellow and red cards, they're assigned to teams as markers of egregious behavior. Uh, the head referee will assign these cards by holding them over their head like this gentleman is doing here. Two yellow cards equals one red card, and one red card is very bad because if you get a red card, you lose the match. Um, not only that, but uh, it also continues throughout the qualifying, uh, qualifying matches and through the elimination matches. So it's not a good idea to get these. Um, in elimination matches, cards are assigned to alliances instead of teams. Obviously, um, if you get a red card in your elimination matches, it's even worse because then the stakes are high. Um, once again, I don't think this will be an issue, but it's a good thing to have on your radar. Speaking of which, John, yeah? Uh, can you get red and yellow cards outside of a specific match? You can. And for instance, if you get a red card outside of a specific match, it could apply to the previous match and that you automatically lose that one, or to the next match, even more likely. So just because you get it outside the match doesn't mean it won't hurt your tournament standards. Good question. Okay, some important do's and don'ts. Uh, obviously, see you full tournament regulations on page 12 that applies to practically everything I'm saying here. First of all, don't throw a match. That should be pretty obvious. Uh, there, you might be tempted to for certain strategical purposes at some point, but it's never been a problem before. It's just not GP, don't do it. Be careful around the playing fields. This means no more than four team members, the drive team, be allowed around the playing field during a match. It means make sure to wear closed toed shoes during the match. It, makes sure, it means to make sure to wear safety goggles and masks this year uh, when you're in the tournaments. This is an integral part of being safe and making sure our team does well. Um, timeouts. This is something that not a lot of people know about, but it's extremely important when you get into the elimination matches. You're not allowed any timeouts during the fall during the quals. That would take too long. But for the Elims, you are allowed one um, one three-minute timeout per alliance, and that's for the entire elimination round. So finals, semifinals, everything. Both teams use this in. Um, the state championship elimination finals, and many other teams have used this in other tournaments last year as well. 
So you definitely want to have it on your radar. It's great for robot repairs, great for deciding strategy, great for just having a little extra time on your hands during the more hectic parts of the tournament. Um, do not save recorded on seating space. No ad hoc Wi-Fi connections are permitted at the tournaments. This is extremely important. Uh, this is extremely important because um, the penalty for this is extremely severe. According to the notebook, if you are caught having an ad hoc Wi-Fi connection, you can actually be immediately disqualified from the entire tournament. Because these Wi-Fi connections can interfere with the connections between the robots and their controllers. And obviously, that leaves the tournaments unable to even happen. So, we want to be extremely careful with Wi-Fi. It's a good idea to just have your phone on airplane mode during the tournaments, uh, except during lunch and um, in other times when it might be necessary not to. It hasn't been a problem yet for our teams, but it's, once again, an important thing to have on your radar because it's kind of, the penalty for it is so severe. Don't sell anything, and be careful about bringing your own food, both due to venue regulations. Okay, so you're at the front of the tournament building. It's, in all likelihood, a pretty cold Colorado morning. What do you do now? Uh, here's the anatomy of a first competition. First, you have your initial bookkeeping or check-in, in which you turned in your assigned consent and release forms, which each team member needs to complete, and we'll talk about that in later sessions as well. They can be completed electronically or on paper, and uh, they're basically a signed note from your parents or guardians that you're allowed to complete. Mr. Alonso. They're no longer accepting paper, they're only accepting electronic. According to the notebooks, they're still expected. Hmm. According to Ms. Luke's, they're not. Okay, well, there you go. Maybe it's Colorado specific. Yeah, it's, it's going to be Colorado specific, which is, once again, why you should communicate with your regional directors and make sure that you know about that. Thank you, Mr. Alonso. Okay, so disregard on paper. We're all only doing it electronically this year. Uh, the team roster of signed participants is presented, and most importantly, the team receives an initial packet during check-in, which includes the tournament schedule, and also your drive team buttons, which I'll talk about later. Your badges, which signify to the refs that you're allowed to be uh, in the playing area when matches occur. Okay, inspections. This is your first order of business after you arrive to a tournament. For Chatfield, we'll wheel our robots into the tournament, and we'll try to get to the inspection station as quickly as possible by basically, um, uh, we'll talk to the judges and we'll get our robots through field inspection and through robot inspection. Field inspect, robot inspection, make sure that your robot is structurally sound, it doesn't have any hazardous materials and calls the rules of first. Field inspection, make sure that the robot doesn't damage the field. Are your wheels so heavy that they actually leave tracks or damage marks on the field while they run? Uh, if they do, then that's bad and you won't pass field inspection. Um, Obviously, there are many more rules than this. Look at appendices B and C of the traditional manual one. Um, and if you get nothing else from this slide, get this last bullet point here, that you must pre-inspect your robot. This will help you make sure to get through inspection quickly because you can help your judge inspect your robot for you um, by, by reassuring them that you've done pre-inspection. You can also, um, this will also catch any mistakes or rules that you've missed and that your robot is in violation of. We don't want anybody to come to the tournament with an unplayable robot because they missed something on the inspection form. So, pre-inspect. Judges interviews. A panel of two or three judges will interview you in a separate room. Ideally, you want to have this done after you get your robot registered, but that's not a rule. You can have your robot registered after judging. And sometimes you need to do that because while robot registration is fluid, Judging is fixed. You get, uh, with your tournament packet, you get the schedule of the judges, and that's when you're, you're getting judged. So you have to make sure to get there on time. Um, judging is extremely important because it determines if your team advances to the next tournament level, not just your performance in the tournament. In fact, you might not be the best player on the field, but if you are the best player in terms of engineering notebook, in terms of grace and professionalism, in terms of the values of first, you can still advance. This is one of the most unique aspects of FIRST in comparison to other sports. It's not just about your performance on the playing field, it's also about how you treat others. Um, you'll have a, during judging, you'll have five minutes to give a presentation. Um, it's recommended that every member of the team speak, have a script and practice it, practice, practice, it makes perfect, and you can talk about any of these aspects. Then you have the driver's meeting. Here are the driver badges I was mentioning earlier. 
uh, the team members of the drive team is the four me members of your team who are allowed on the field during matches. This is two, up to two human drivers. It can be one, but it can be no more than two. One human player and one drive coach. Uh, teams are also des teams also have a designated media person who stands in their own box near the match. Um, so, uh, but they're not considered part of the drive team. Uh, drive team members are invited to hear about the rules, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then you have practice time. Throughout the tournament, uh, teams might get a chance to practice on their separate fields. Make sure that you uh, do this uh, with the spirit of gracious professionalism, because we want to make sure we share the field respectively. Uh, this is respectfully. Sorry, this is very important because it gives you once again more experience on the field and more experience of working with other teams. Uh, here is some extra vocab you might hear in a competition. Um, Alliance captain is the student representative that represents the Alliance during Alliance selection, which I will get to next week in that presentation. The Alliance station is the actual square you stand in when you're on the drive, uh, when you're near the field and you're controlling the robot for the four members of the drive team. The pit area is the area where teams can work on the robot, make sure to wear safety glasses and of course a mask. The sports start is what we uh, signify uh, is how we signify the three, two, one countdown that lets you start your robot. Um, the surrogate match is probably um, probably the most complex of these. Basically, it's, a, it's an extra qualification match that's scheduled in order to make the team um, the team rankings after the qualification matches more um, more equal. Though it does not directly affect your score, it's still important for calculating the scores of other teams to make sure to still do well during this match. Don't throw it for any day. All right, any questions? I realize that was a lot to go through and we didn't uh, take much time. I didn't want to because I want to make sure you have plenty of time to build. But if you have any questions, please ask me, uh, Mr. Alonzo, your, um, Sam, or um, anybody else who was present at the uh, the last season about manual questions. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, the best guy to ask is what? The manual. Exactly, the manual. Um, that is our presentation for today.